I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much to Anna and Olivia for inviting me and my co-authors, uh, Melissa, John, and Eric unfortunately can't join us. I want to start by explaining why this paper shouldn't be on this program, but actually is related. It's not about financial literacy, <coughs> it's not about retirement. Yet, I think it is relevant for three ways, and as you hear the, the other 11 minutes, you'll have to judge. First of all, financial literacy is all about understanding what consumers know, how they behave, and then trying to change that behavior. What this is about is understanding how consumers behave and know and act, but then rather than changing their behavior, adopting products to that behavior. Second of all, financial retirement is a really important savings goal. But the research that I've done in other, in other uh, venues has shown that unless people have kind of pre-retirement savings, retirement savings is just too far off. So this is about a pre-retirement savings product. And third of all, um, and some of you who are on this financial literacy circuit know that, that the nonprofit that I chaired and I founded is on the circuit too, talking about some other work that we do. And the work that we use to describe both that and this is a simple word called fun. So what we're trying to do is to instill a little bit of fun and excitement into financial literacy through video gaming and into savings through this product. So let me, again, quickly, using my New York style uh, speed of, of speaking, go through all this. Uh, we know that savings rates are really abysmal. Um, one of the factoids that I'd like to focus on is a, a paper that Anna and I have just recently written where we've surveyed Americans, a uh, representative sample of Americans, and 50% of Americans say they can't get a hold of $2,000 within 30 days. And that's whether by savings, friends, family, credit, anything. So again, retirement savings is a wonderful goal, but if you can't scrape together $2,000 for an emergency, um, probably you have a more immediate goals. And a lot of the policy initiatives around saving have focused on changing the choice architecture, which has been tremendously successful. David Labson and others are to, to, to be given credit for that. Financial incentives, and then embedding savings in social networks. We started from a different point of view. And that point of view is, let's start with where people actually are, which is gaming activities are extraordinarily popular. Um, as we know, 42 states and, eight, and the District of Columbia offer state lotteries, bring in roughly $60 billion in sales. Kind of an interesting and amazing statistic, in 2008, households in America spent more money on lottery tickets than on alcohol. Uh, but here's one that's not in the paper and I'm even more excited about. I come from the state of Massachusetts. <laughs> and in Massachusetts, what does the average resident spend on lottery tickets? Where resident means not just adult, not conditional on buying them, not everybody. Take total sales divided by total population. All right? This is the audience participation part. How many of you think that the average in Massachusetts is by four? Well, this is per household. I'm going to give you per individual. So per individual, divide by two, like 200 bucks, does that sound good? 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 725 dollars. The average person in Massachusetts spends 725 dollars a year on lottery tickets. So you can see why if you want to focus on savings and go where people are, this is a really interesting place. So the goal of this chap, of this, uh, of this paper, is to explore a set of products that have been offered for over 300 years. Um, they go by lots of names. In order to not to go to jail, we call them prize link savings. Um, and I want to describe what prize link savings are, why might they be popular, um, how they're used around the world and they have been used, and then issues that could prevent this from widespread use in the United States. So what are these products? In the simplest form, imagine that everybody in this room put their money into a savings account. It generated a pool of interest, and at the end of the day, we lotteried off the interest. So we, in aggregate, we're paid a market rate of return. But what happens is the distribution of that return is redistributed uh, through the form of a lottery. So your principal is never at risk. Now, um, so, and you can obviously make these so that they're, they're, fair, they're fair games. So they're not kind of the lottery where you lose 40 to 50 cents on the dollar in order to finance education. So why might these pop be popular? And again, there's a lot of great theory here. So individuals may have preference for skewed returns. Would you rather have a 100% chance of a dollar or a 0.0001% chance of a million? Turns out that a lot of people would rather have the latter. Um, any of you from New York City, you might have seen the subway uh, kiosks in New York recently. There's a picture of uh, the, the arch in Washington Square, and there's a little price tag on it. And basically, the lottery slogan is something like, you know, a life-changing payout. And that's what these are all about, small chance at a life-changing payout. 
People may get utility from lottery play, and, and there's umpteen behavioral uh, finance and behavioral economics reasons why these may be popular products. Misestimation of odds, optimism, just a lot of good stuff there. So it's clear why savers might like a product like this. How about issuers? I come from a business school. This is a particularly easy product to develop. It's a particularly easy product to market. Um, it doesn't require tremendous amounts of financial engineering. Um, unfortunately, it's illegal. <laughs> Historically, these products have been offered since 1694. Uh, in 1694, they were used in something called the Million Adventure, uh, which was to finance the Nine Years' War. Uh, and some details are in the paper and up here. Basically, if you bought this bond, you got a chance to, uh, to uh, get a, a large prize. And if, you, if this conference were being held in the 19th century, we would all know about these because this would be the predominant way of financing most of uh, continental Europe. Some of you may have seen a paper I wrote. Olivia, in fact, was, uh, chaired a session at the AEDAs uh, two years ago now on, on the UK premium bond program. Um, the UK premium bond program has been around since 1957. The tagline that it was launched with was savings with a thrill. Um, and there, instead of, and this is a government bond program, so yes, the Bureau of Public Debt could do this. Um, and what the British equivalent of the Bureau of Public Debt offers is a bond product where the interest rate in aggregate is basically equal to the guilt rate, but rather than hand out interest as proportional to your, uh, your the amount that you have deposited, the interest is paid in the form of prizes with the largest prize being a million pounds. So each month, Mr. Million knocks on someone's door and tells them they're now a million. 23 million premium bondholders in, in the UK. Um, I wanted to skip to this. This is the distribution of holdings by income. Um, so the red line is the fraction of that population that owns premium bonds. And like any financial product, it goes up with income, starting with about 12% uh, and going up to about 30%. By the way, in average, more, for, more Britons own premium bonds than hold stock. Um, the one on the top is normalized as a fraction of the most um, widely held product for that income category. So what you're seeing is, you know, if, if this was the top product, you'd be at, at, at one, and if this was a small fraction of that top product, you'd be, you'd be much lower. What you see is a kind of a little hump at the bottom. What that little hump's all about is this product is attractive to people who are not very wealthy, in the same way that lottery tickets are attractive to people who are not very wealthy. So um, changing gears a little bit and changing geographies, let's go down to South Africa, where I spent some time with FNB Bank, um, where they ran a program called the Million a Month Account, which has a lovely acronym of MAMA. Um, <laughs> and the Million a Month Account is exactly, in some sense, like the government program in the UK, a million rand a month um, prize. Uh, and uh, it was tremendously successful. I just had a doctoral student who, who's crunched all the numbers. Basically, take up of this was about twice as high as any savings product that the bank was offering, and it actually had differential positive impact among unbanked and underbanked in South Africa. Unfortunately, it was shut down by the Lottery Commission in South Africa as an illegal lottery. These programs exist all around the world except in the United States. Um, and we, and the, we as my little nonprofit, Doorways to Dreams Fund, in conjunction with eight credit unions and the Michigan Credit Union League and the Filing Research Institute and the Center for Financial Service Innovation and the help of some very smart lawyers in Washington, found a loophole uh, which allowed us to test this program in Michigan. The loophole in particular allows Michigan credit unions to do what are called savings promotion raffles. We were told no lobbying, but on the other hand, um, this is a really interesting piece of, uh, of uh, legislation. Let me tell you about Save to Win. We ran this for 11 months in eight credit unions in Michigan, um, and the places where this is product was sold was Flint in Detroit, and really you know, high net worth places. Um, and these may not seem like huge numbers. Um, I think I, we're missing kind of a number up there. But it's about 12,000 accounts and about $9 million in deposits in places like Detroit and Flint. Our expectation going in, especially going in in January of 2009, to try to remember what that was like, um, was that no one would buy these products. No one would save in Flint and Detroit. Our partners are ecstatic about this. And 20 credit unions will be doing this next year. There are now bills uh, pending in Rhode Island and in Maryland to allow this to become law in their states. Um, 
and language written, which will never get put into any manager's amendment in the, in the uh, railroad that is financial and form. Some of the statistics are pretty interesting. It basically is a savings product that appeals to people with low wealth, low income, non-savers, and gamblers. We've done some mall intercept work in Indiana before we started this. And the four attributes of the people who wanted this product, and about 15% said they were interested, were people with little savings, without a savings plan, lottery players, and optimistic about their future. Unfortunately, this product is illegal for two reasons. First, states have a monopoly on lotteries. Right? And their monopoly on lotteries is how we finance that education and a lot of other things. But they're very particular about not letting private parties uh, get into the lottery business. And second of all, in the wake of the, the Great Depression or the Great Moderation or whatever we want to call it in the 1930s, um, the National Banking Act and most other banking regulations outlawed any bank from having to do anything with the lottery. That's why you can't buy a lottery ticket in a bank. Um, so um, the interesting kind of disconnect here is this is a product that works for low income <laughs> it helps, you know, and you don't have to like market it too hard because they get it immediately. The tagline for million a month account was everything to lose, everything to gain, nothing to lose. Right? And so in my last minute summary here, these are an intriguing way to encourage savings. All right? Now put on your financial literacy and retirement hat. How can you make <coughs> these kind of activities more fun? How can you meet people where they are? Despite the long international history, little US experience. We need more rigorous research. I can show you convenience samples that show that this product works quite well. Um, we have yet to do a full randomized control trial in order to demonstrate that this has the kind of impacts that the convenience samples would suggest. And if it's promising, it would require quite a change in laws. So I understand I haven't talked about retirement. I haven't talked about financial literacy. But hopefully, you can see the parallels between the thinking behind this product and the consumer reception behind this product and what we're all here to uh, think about and talk about. Thank you.